Welcome everyone, let's get settled in. We're gonna start in about a minute. All right, I'm seeing people join us. We actually have nearly 500 people registered, so this is pretty exciting. Welcome, welcome as you come in. And folks, go ahead, post in the chat, tell us where you're calling in from. All right, I'm seeing Toronto, Washington, DC. I know we have San Francisco and New Orleans here in our presenters. Atlanta, Texas, all right. Welcome, welcome. Snowy Denver. All right. All right, I'm starting to see some Europe sign in. I just saw Belgium. Keep it coming. Pretty exciting. All right. Hope everyone's doing well today. Welcome, welcome. If you're just joining, you're alongside hundreds of other customer success professionals. Tell us in the chat where you're calling in from. We got people here, North Carolina, Texas, Canada, all over Canada, Utah, Massachusetts. Let's see if we get every state. I don't know. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to today's virtual rig. Um, as I've been saying, as you come in, post to us in the chat where you're calling in from. We'd love to see uh, at the moment. Man, we've probably hit probably 20 states. We got international customers. So keep telling us where you're from. So thank you for joining us today at our virtual rig on cracking the code to customer onboarding. Our goal today is to create an informal atmosphere for customer success leaders to network with peers in the industry. And we ask that you participate today using the, the Q&A and also the chat that you'll see here in Big Marker. My name is Naomi Aiken. I'm a team lead for customer success at Churn Zero. A little bit about me, I've been in SaaS software for about 13 years now in various uh, capacities and roles. I'm located in the Washington, D.C. area. And since we're having a virtual coffee break, I'll share with you my mug. I have here my pug mug. I'm a dog lover. With that, I'd like to also introduce our leaders. I'll start with Kristen Heyer, the founder and CEO of the Success League. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kristen. It's good to see you all here today. Uh, I am the CEO of the Success League. We are a training and consulting firm based in San Francisco that is focused on customer success. Um, I'm also the host of a podcast called Reading for Success that um, is a review uh, podcast that talks about books and articles for leadership in our field. And my mug today is my coffee before talkie mug. I'm on the West Coast, so um, we have a lot of East Coast clients and I'm up early and I have to remember I have to drink this first. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Perfect. Our other presenter today is Antoinette Aboud, the Director of Customer Success at Level Set. Um, Antoinette, tell us about yourself. Hello, everyone. As Naomi said, I'm Antoinette, the Director of Customer Success at Level Set, which is a tech startup located out of New Orleans, Louisiana. We're in the construction space and we help construction professionals get what they earn. Um, so help them get paid faster, speed up payment. And today I have a very special mug. I think, can everyone see it? It was a gift from my grandmother. It has a random poem on it written for someone named Sally, since Antoinette's name never appears on any mugs. So. Perfect, loving it, loving it. 
For those of you who've just joined us, uh, I'm seeing more and more people enter here. As I mentioned, we have nearly 500 people registered for today's discussion. Tell us in the chat where you're dialing in from. It's really great to see uh, the diverse set of people we have here on the line. With that, I know there's a lot of excitement uh, today about our discussion topic, so I'd like to introduce our three main topics for today. We'll start with onboarding versus implementation, getting customers to embrace your product instead of just moving them through the motions and kind of hoping for adoption, and lastly, defining onboarding success beyond just its completion. Okay, three great topics for us today. We're going to start with our first topic here, onboarding versus implementation. Now, I encourage everyone um, to either post in the chat or in the Q&A that you'll see there um, in the platform. I'm going to keep an eye on that and help this discussion move forward. All right, Kristen, I'm going to start with you. Onboarding versus implementation, tell us. <laughs> um, these two terms get used so interchangeably in our field, and they're really very different things. So the way that I like to think of onboarding is it's the broad plan for your new customers. It's strategic. It's focused on building that new relationship. And it includes things like setting long-term goals with the customer, planning for the change that's inevitably going to be a part of you know, rolling out a new solution. Uh, it's the rollout plan itself, it's training, it's success planning, all of those broad pieces that are very relationship based. And it's about your customer's business. I think implementation is kind of a smaller subset of that. So implementation is the project of technically getting your customers set up. And so that's very tactical. It's a technology or project focused piece of bringing on board a new customer. And it's all about things like rolling out the technology, setting up integrations, tailoring that technology for a particular customer, the architecture and design components of that. Um, and that's the part that's about your technology. So between onboarding and implementation, onboarding is about the customer's business and implementation is about your technology. And so that's kind of how I think about that. I love that distinction. I think that's a wonderful way to define it. Um, Antoinette, tell us, what are your thoughts on onboarding versus implementation? Yeah, so it's, it's actually very similar to Kristen. When I think about implementation, that's the checklist of technological things that we have to go through. We need to make sure that the integration is there. We need to make sure that the users are added and they have access and, you know, all of the different data points are in place. Um, but a smooth implementation can help ensure success, but it's not going to guarantee it. The onboarding is the human component. It's the change management part that like like brings in human psychology and how you get people to adopt early and you kind of, it sounds weird to say it, but manufacture these wow moments and these milestones that you can celebrate small wins and get them to be really excited about your product long term. Because uh, it's your first impression during onboarding. Um, and it really is that big start to the relationship. So you want it to be this magical moment, even if you're doing something like us, where it's like, this is a lot of like compliance and paperwork and getting money in the door. Like what's like truly wow worthy about that. And it's like, you'd be amazed. It like it's making people easier and aligning it with their goals. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that. And tell me, um, and, and by the way, I'll remind the audience, please uh, take advantage of the Q&A um, and the chat that you see in big marker. I'm seeing questions come in. I'll be vetting those and, and giving those to our presenters as, as well for discussion. Here's something I want to throw out there. Training. Training your users. Is that onboarding or is that implementation? Antoinette, I'm going to start with you. So the way that we have ours set up right now is um, it, it's a part of our onboarding experience. Um, you could add it to like in order to implement the software, you must have a training. But I really think that the on the training sessions are another wow moment. And we actually have our 
mid-market and strategic trainer on this call right now. So she's listening. I better get this right. Um, but it's I, I consider it part of the onboarding because it's part of building that relationship, creating that experience, getting more intel, making sure that we're getting feedback to the CSM on like the different aspects of the people's jobs, like who who's on these calls who's using level set what did they think was really exciting when we were going through the training so we consider that part of onboarding yeah um let's throw this at let's throw this into the mix as well right training onboarding versus implementation and who does it right is is this the csm handling it or do we have a separate trainer uh or something like that kristen what have you seen? <laughs> um, I, I'm going to give a typical consultant answer and say it depends. Um, <laughs> but I think the things it depends on um, are, you know, the size and scale of your organization, your customer base to some degree. In an early stage company, I think you can have the CSMs be responsible for training. And I think there's some advantages to doing that in an early stage company because it helps you learn about your customers in a way that I don't think you can if you're not as hands on with them. Over time, however, as you move toward a more mature organization or even an organization that needs to scale, I think you start to see a lot of different roles pull apart from the CSM and one of those is training. Because at a certain point, and especially if you have a very complex product and training is a huge component of onboarding, you need somebody who specializes in training. Enablement is its own skill set and it's, it's not, wildly different from a CS skill set, but it is a little different. And I think sometimes there's a need to actually have someone who's building out your enablement um, materials. And so that is somebody who has that area of expertise in their background. And so I think over time, companies start to separate that out into its own function. So even companies as small as 300 employees, I often see that in its own area um, beyond customer success. Yeah, I agree. And I think ultimately also, you know, from a scaling up your organization standpoint, you think of your CSMs, how much can they handle, right? Can they manage all of their current customers and also be onboarding their um, additional customers and tackling all the training? Maybe, but maybe not. So there, you know, there's a certain level of what's what's feasible to expect of your CSMs versus other people in your organization. Let's talk about leadership for a moment. Um, so when it comes to leadership over your CS team, um, Kristen, are you generally seeing organizations have actual separate leadership for onboarding? and the people who fall in that umbrella versus implementation? Or is this all kind of under one umbrella? We just have people doing different roles. Um, I see both and it's about 50-50. Um, if it's a technically complex product, I'll often see implementation live with the technical team, um, at least in part. So sometimes I see that on the product team or even the engineering team, depending on what is involved in implementation. Um, in terms of the broader onboarding um, function, that's typically a part of customer success. Um, but even then there's sometimes separate sub teams that handle that, um, that sit underneath the customer success leader or customer officer. They may be in their own group or they may be kind of dotted line reporting into a technology group. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen the same as well in my in my experience too. All right, my next one's for Antoinette. Um, how can we avoid information overload for our new customers that we are implementing and onboarding? That's a really great question. And it's something that I think every company grapples with. I mean, even if you're onboarding new employees, you're thinking about like the information overload, drinking from a hose, and I think a lot of it is about layering and saying, okay, this is my, this is our customer's initial goal. And this is what it takes to get them to that specific goal. Once they've accomplished that and you celebrate, then you move on to the next thing. So you're doing it in layers instead of loading it all on at once and being like, this is everything that we can do. 
aren't you happy you're here? And then they walk away thinking, this is hard. Um, so we want to make it really easy and say, okay, the most important goal you have is this. We're going to accomplish that. And then we're going to do what's next. And you just small bites. Yeah, I'm actually going to agree with you there. In my experience, um, that that is the method method, excuse me, that I've seen most successful with the majority of my clients. Although I will say, there are clients that'll come along that want to drink from the fire hose. They're jumping in with two feet. They are ready. So I think it's critical as an organization to be able to say, "All right, you want it." Here you go. Um, but also realizing that most people kind of do need that in logical chunks first. Definitely. I think one thing that's super interesting too is just being able to have all of the content ready and deliverable um, so people can adapt to their own learning style. Like there are people who are like, throw it all at me. And then you have the ability to just throw it all at them and come back and test for understanding um, and check for understanding. But then there are people who want to be, want their hand held through it. Um, and so I think it depends on your product, uh, the team that you have, and then the resources you have in place to build a library of educational materials and tools. I agree. Don't worry, we're dog lovers around here. Don't worry, Antoinette. We got dogs. That's cool. It's Kristen, let me throw. Time. <laughs> Kristen, let me throw the next one uh, towards you. Let's talk about the transition mm -hmm. from implementation to onboarding. What can we do to make that smooth um, and seamless for our customer? So I see implementation and onboarding being parallel tracks that happen at the same time. So it's not like one starts and then one ends and then the other one starts. It's that they both start from the very beginning. Um, I think if you think about it that way, you tend to avoid some of the problems that naturally come if you sort of look at it as two separate steps. So onboarding, I think the most important part of that is getting the CSM engaged with the buyer or the decision maker immediately. What tends to happen during really long onboarding processes is that the buyer relationship gets lost because you get pushed off onto somebody who's kind of more the tactical project manager for implementation and everyone sort of forgets that there was a business driver behind this whole thing. And so I think that there needs to be an onboarding track that is planned out in advance for what is occurring during onboarding. And then the implementation should be a separate technical track that is occurring at the same time. And sometimes those two tracks come together so that all of the team is, you know, kind of talking about the key milestones, especially if it's a longer implementation. But both of those need to be happening simultaneously, I think. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, I, I agree with that importance. I also, I'll, I'll throw into the mix, the importance of explaining that to the customer. Mm -hmm. We are on a parallel track here. We're mm -hmm. going to guide you through it. We're going to help you. But, you know, there's two things going on. We got to implement whatever it is we're implementing. We got to do that and do it well. But we also got to onboard you and, and really fold you into, um, into our community, into our product and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Folks on the line, keep the questions coming. Um, like I said, we had nearly 500 people register for this event. We got tons of people on the line and tons of questions, and I'm loving it. Doing the best I can to address them. Keep them coming. We're going to now hit on question number two. Getting customers to embrace your product instead of merely moving them through the motions and crossing our fingers and hoping for adoption. All right, Antoinette, tell us, how are we going to do this? Uh, definitely, and it's a great question to ask, and I know we all ask ourselves that, especially when you see one customer going through your onboarding program and they're drinking the Kool-Aid, they're doing all of the things, they're really excited about it, and then you have one that's stalled. Um, and so we always look at that and say, like, what can we continue to do? And I think a lot of it is, um, it goes back to what Kristen was talking about with the first question we had, where we always make it about our customers' objectives and bringing their goals back into the conversation. And it's almost every conversation you have during onboarding and you have those scheduled recurring calls, you're tying it directly back to their goal 
And sometimes you have to ask the hard question if they're not buying in, like what's preventing you? What's the road blocker? And keep reminding them this is where we we are in the onboarding process. We like to have a visual graphic. Like this is what your onboarding is going to look like. This is what you've accomplished. It's almost like that credit karma thing. I log in and it's telling me like how well I'm doing. People like to know how well they're doing compared to other people. And so just keeping that going and constantly reminding them when you do X, you're going to get this instant gratification and make instant gratification moments. And then the long term, here's the the other benefit that you're going to get. Um, so it's a lot of like change management strategy, I think, to keep people engaged early and get them to use as quickly as possible. Like you want them in your in their account right away, because the longer it takes to get them logged in, the more likely it is that they're going to push it off because it becomes less of a priority. Yeah, I, I am with you on that. Um, I'm also going to throw in, I, I think as, as customer facing people, we should not be afraid to let a customer know where they are, where they stand, like you said, compared to other customers and what that means, right? You know, like what's the implication there? 100%. Um, yeah. Um, Kristen, let's go to you here. Um, tell us uh, any words of wisdom you have for us about helping, <laughs> you're wise, you got wisdom, um, about helping our customer truly embrace the product. So I'll go back to what Antoinette said. This is a change management exercise, 100%. Um, I just was leaning over to grab one of my favorite books on this topic, which is a series of articles by Harvard Business Review called On Change Management. Do you have that one too, Antoinette? Or do you have a different one? Show yours. What is it? Switch. I have Switch. Okay. <laughs> Which is one that I like. <laughs> yeah, good books, you guys. Um, so the first article in this one is uh, by John Cotter. And there's a whole framework for how to guide an organization through change. And I think that CSMs can kind of use a scaled down version of, of that to guide customers through onboarding. Um, there's things like you need to create a sense of urgency among the people who are gonna be driving this. There's the need to have kind of a, an organizational group that's guiding on the customer side, the users through the change process. There's a whole bunch of communication and vision design that needs to happen as a part of this. Um, there's the need to share short-term wins like that's that's one of the things that gets people really excited about change is like, oh, somebody else's job just got better because we're using this really cool new tool. Like that kind of stuff getting communicated to the broader group or, you know, a person selling something for the first time as a CSM because they had a tool that made that easy for them. Those things you need to communicate because that gets everybody else excited about using it. And then to kind of continually think of it as an iterative process onboarding doesn't ever really end <laughs> you should always be thinking about the what's next with your customers especially if you have a big solution and your company maybe has a model of land and expand that expand part is your responsibility as a csm and so you know you always want to be thinking of what's the next thing we can onboard and what's the next thing that we can move them forward toward so that's how i think about it yeah, yeah. There's always more your customer can be doing with your product. And it's our job to get them there and get them excited to be there and to stay excited about it, for sure, for sure. I love that both of you shared a resource here. This is a, a question we're getting in the chat here and that we all hear all the time, right? How can I get better at this? And, you know, you mentioned change management. Absolutely. Um, now, actually, so let, let's talk about this a little bit. Antoinette, as you, when you hire onto your CS team, do you look for people that have experience with change management? Um, you know, one of the big things we look, and I think some of that depends on whether we're looking for an SMB CSM or a mid-market or enterprise CSM. 
With the SMB CSM, we're looking for some experience with relationship management and just talking and engaging with people. But as you get up into mid-market and the enterprise sector, we are looking for people who have not just extensive relationship management experience, but the change management is really important and being able to manage up at an organization. So it's you're, you're sometimes trying to wrangle an end user, a director level, all the way up to the C-suite. And you need to have somebody who's really comfortable doing that and, and using different approaches and onboarding them differently because of their position and the interaction they're gonna have with your product. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, Kristen, my next one's for you. In talking about helping our customer embrace our product, how does that differ between a low touch scenario and a high touch scenario? Yeah, I mean, it's it's how do you leverage technology, right? And you know, not every company can afford a high touch model. You know, and in a high touch model, you can you can as a CSM have all these very um, labor intensive things going on like conversations with different people at different layers in the organization and goal setting and success planning and all of that feeds into this excitement about the solution and you know the spread of news about the product and excitement about adoption and all of that in a in a low touch model you have to get clever <laughs> it's much harder to design but in a lot of ways it's um more interesting in some ways because you have to leverage technology. So you, I think the way to think about that is, okay, if you were in a high touch program, what would be those touch points that would drive toward adoption? And then how do you take each of those touch points and convert them into some sort of technology driven um, method? So, you know, let me give you an example. So let's say one of the big parts of um, doing a, a good onboarding uh, program in your high touch program is having a huge kickoff meeting where you bring all of those people together. You could think about can you have a pre recorded virtual one of those, you know, where people need to go and watch it? Can you track who's watched that video? Can you think about other ways that leverage lots of interesting technology to guide people down the path that you know you want them to go down? Or in a low touch program where it's not entirely technology driven, is that the right place to plug in a CSM? Because it's a high enough value activity that that's a good spot to put them. And there's other touch points that you could automate more easily. So you really kind of have to look touch point by touch point at that journey that you're taking the customer on and really consider what is the best way to deliver this experience. And is it possible to do it in an automated way that would make this program cost effective. Um, because the bottom line is not every company can afford a high touch program or not every segment of your customer base warrants that. And so you have to, you have to consider it even if you don't personally like that. <laughs> Yeah, right. It's all about your business model, what's scalable um, and, and truly what what type of engagement cadence you set up for your CSMs with those customers. I want to touch on celebrating wins. It's come up a few times already. We all know it's important um, in, in the overall process of getting them to truly embrace. Right. So I, I want to hear from you all, you know, what are creative ways to celebrate wins? And, and I want to actually start with one here. Um, whoever you're working with, right, your POC at whatever company, client company, they've done something awesome. I don't care if it's small. I don't care if it's big. Congratulate them and tell their boss, right? So for me, when I'm a client, when I'm not on the vendor side, I'm a client client and I do something well and someone contacts my CCO to tell them how proud of uh, how proud of me they are, man, that's a way to win me over. Um, tell us, how do you celebrate wins? Oh, sorry. Let's go with Antoinette. Sorry, I should have said. Um, oh, sorry. Right when I went on mute. Um, 
um, he started barking. So um, one of the ways that we do it, and it's it's funny that you mentioned like you want them to go tell their boss or you want to go tell their boss. We have this concept here, a level set of like a, a payment hero. But essentially, we want to make our customer the hero of this story. We're the tool that they use. And so some of it is, is early on in the onboarding process, like kind of noticing like what's going to make them the hero at their company and then taking those small milestones, celebrating it in a big way. And, you know, sometimes it's sending them something being like, hey, look this thing happened over here because you did this. Like, this is amazing. Let me like loop in your boss, like give your boss this report. That's going to show them everything that you've done in the last three months and the impact it's had on your days to payment. And they absolutely love it. It's that creating a moment of pride, um, which is a really important part in building those peaks. It's actually another book by the Heath brothers. It's called The Power of Moments. And um, it's uh, like, it talks about those moments that really help people build that kind of attachment and loyalty to like your brand. Um, and when you help celebrate them, like it, it does really make it something that's a lot more special. Um, and then we'll do some things like for our larger customers that have more complex onboardings. Uh, like we have one customer where we're gonna be sending them level set socks because we just knocked their socks off. So it's having fun, not being afraid to be a little bit silly and to be very human. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kristen, have you seen anything creative uh, along these lines of celebrating wins you wanna share? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's um, a huge way to leverage contests when you're rolling something new out to a team. Um, and I, I'm a, if anyone here has ever worked with me in the past, you know, I'm a huge fan of contests. So I think you can create a contest for anything. You could have a contest for which team in the company, you know, adopts a solution the fastest by seeing how many people are logging in. You could have a contest for an individual team on what they're doing inside a new solution. I think contests are great for trying to drive short term behavior that you want to change. And it helps to establish really good habits right from the beginning because there's a little reward. And so you get, you get that little dopamine rush when you win something and um, it kind of gamifies what could be an arduous task of learning something new. So I like I love that. Very motivating, absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's take a poll from our lovely folks on the line here. Um, so uh, our poll, hopefully it just popped up. Um, it should say, does your CSM team have set criteria to determine customer onboarding success? All right. So give us a second here to let everyone uh, add that in. Antoinette and Kristen, you can respond as well. Everyone's welcome to uh, to do this poll here. Does your team have set criteria to determine customer onboarding success? We're gonna close the poll in a minute. We'll see the results. Uh, just give us a second here to let everyone Who's respond. Here, Hands of what? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead and answer the poll. Um, you'll uh, you'll see the responses here come up in Big Marker as well. That's the platform we're using today. And let's switch gears and talk about our third topic: defining success, onboarding success beyond just its completion. Okay, um, Kristen, I'm going to start. With you. Tell us about onboarding success beyond its mere completion. So to me, onboarding success is really overall customer success because it doesn't matter. Your product doesn't really matter in the greater scheme of things. It's really about is the customer achieving the business value that they were after when they purchase your solution. Your solution is simply a means to an end. So if you, I'm thinking about customer success, I'm thinking about what was the outcome they were after 
um, that that is going to prove to them that it was worth it to go through what they just went through with you in terms of onboarding and implementation. And so I think you want to be setting goals right at the beginning. Like I talked about earlier, those two parallel tracks. In the onboarding track, the relationship track, you should be setting those success goals from day one. And those should be not about just how quickly are you implementing the solution, because again, that's just the means to an end. It should be about what is the objective for the business that they were after, and are they getting closer to that? Because that's what really matters to the client. You need to be continually measuring results and talking about those goals. And what you'll find with your customers is over time, their, their ideas about what success means to them will shift, right? So once they get through onboarding and implementation, you know, it's natural for them to be thinking, oh, it's this product, it's this product is gonna solve all my problems. Um, as they get through that, they will pick their heads up and go, oh yeah, that business thing we were trying to fix, how are we doing on that? And then a year later, they'll have a completely different business objective that they wanna work with you on. And so you need to, as a CSM, I think, be constantly tracking that change over time. But to me, you know, the key to this is one, staying in touch with that buyer from day one, and two, setting business objective goals instead of just technology goals. And to me, that is what, you know, is real success around onboarding. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Certainly dependent on the organization, but all, all critical points. Um, so Antoinette, let, let's go to you next. Um, defining onboarding success. Do you um, or have you seen actual specific KPIs for CS teams around onboarding or how do you measure that they're doing it well? Definitely. And it, it is something hard to measure. And I thought, thought that it was really interesting that so many people said some what because you, you kind of feel like you have it but like maybe you don't and you're constantly evolving those metrics um but i i think that what kristen said where it's measuring it against are you achieving your customers objectives and some ways that we try to kind of quantify that to say we're doing the job or not is you know if somebody signs up on a monthly plan at three months, can we convert them to an annual? Are they are have they achieving their objectives enough so we can, as we call it here, put a ring on it? And they're gonna commit to staying with us for longer. And we have like actually Kristen competitions for our CSMs, like how many of you can put a ring on that? Um, we'll do our reporting uh, frequently with the customers, especially the ones that need those longer onboarding and implementation, it's more technology. This was your goal when you signed up with us. Here is where you are. You achieve that goal, big celebration. What's next? Are you acquiring more business? Are you growing? Um, and so the expansion component is also like, are we doing well with them? Is Are they using enough of our product that they want to invest in more? Um, so that's another way that we can measure that onboarding success. Um, so it's, it's that combination of retention, upsell, engagement, um, and when they're hitting those milestones, um, are we successfully setting the next one and then completing that? Um, so those are some of the kind of like hard numbers that we try to use to see like what's the percentage of our people converting to annuals? What's the percentage of our people renewing on those annuals? Um, so that's kind of how we're trying to look at it from a more like KPI perspective. Sure, sure. Uh, so I'll also throw in there from my experience, um, we have to define onboarding and the end of onboarding somehow, right? There's always gonna be some gray area, but we have to at least set some sort of metrics there as a company of, of what we are working toward to consider someone onboarded and then proceed forward in nurturing them as a live customer in our customer base, right? So Kristen, let me throw this to you. Let's say, we have a customer that finished onboarding, but in, in our opinion, they didn't do a great job. They barely got there. It took way too long. What do we do next? How do we, how do we go beyond the onboarding to nurture them correctly? Well, I think, you know, if you've kind of planned out a 
um, kind of a prescriptive way to get them through onboarding. That doesn't happen as much, but it, you know, it's sometimes there are customers that just kind of don't, uh, they kind of squeak through that whole process and don't put in a lot of energy. I think that you can have them repeat pieces of onboarding that maybe they didn't do so well at. So it's almost like, hey, you know, we're, we're glad you made it. Um, I would not count this against the onboarding team in terms of any KPIs that are in place, but I think I would then kind of reset that customer back to the stage that they kind of stopped succeeding. <laughs> you know, and often I see this where people didn't all make it through training. It's usually kind of toward the tail end that I tend to see this. You know, it's hard to get through a really long project. And um, so, you know, maybe you want to reset around training and have them go through training again. Or maybe they have an implementation that was a real struggle and they're not all the way through it yet. So maybe keep going on that project and set some new objectives around that part of the actual implementation itself. Um, but I think it's okay to kick people back. <laughs> um, but again, you know, it, it, if if the team that was in charge of kind of, you know, I see a lot of companies where the objective is get them through in 90 days, get them through in six months or whatever it is. You know, I wouldn't penalize the team that has done a really good job of trying to get a customer to go through all of that. And it was successful on the surface, but it wasn't successful at a deeper level. I would just push the customer back through some of that earlier material so that they do get to that deeper level. Yeah, and let's let's build on that further. Um, Antoinette, in, in your experience, um, how can we how can we tactfully tell our customer and work with them on maybe a little redo, a little step back a little? Um, you know, how can we do that tactfully? Definitely. We, we have to do this sometimes. Um, the construction industry is wonderful. Not a lot of super tech savvy people uh, at certain levels. So we have to put people back through training. Um, and sometimes we'll, you know, get on a call with them and you have to say like, hey, look, I noticed this in, in the account. Like, how are you feeling about this? And kind of let them start to acknowledge, you know what, I'm not actually really comfortable with that. Um, what do you think I should do? Because at this point, we did the onboarding successfully. They know we're the expert. They're relying on us. They want our opinion. And then you say, hey, why don't why don't you and I walk through this and do it informally? And then at the end say, I think it'd be really helpful if we had you walk through this with our with Piper or whoever the onboarding specialist was for that, whoever the trainer is. How do you learn best? Do you want me to send you some videos on this? We have customers who like to print out screenshots of things and put them in a binder so they know what to do. So we'll sort of adapt it a little bit at that point um, to make sure that we're like working with their learning style. But as long as you approach it from a really human perspective, they're going to be really happy that you're offering that help. And and they're going to want to talk to you about it because nobody wants to feel like they're the person who doesn't get it. So that's yeah. what we find, just an honest conversation. Absolutely. That's yeah, oh, I was going to say, I think that's a much better experience than to just sort of say, oh, your 90 days are up, so you're done with onboarding now and just kind of walk away. Um, I hate it when I see teams doing that because it's kind of their KPI or their process but it's a terrible customer experience. And I think it's a great, what, yeah. and what you just described is a great experience. You're looking at what they actually need and helping them get it. And it's one of those things too, like we have go live metrics for our team and we they're different for the SMB team than they are for mid-market and strategic, but we also know that those are our internal, almost like a vanity metric. Mm -hmm. So while that's a component of their KPIs, there's this retention thing afterwards that we're also looking at. And we always know like, people can go back into training at any point in time. They could go back into, like they need to make a technical change, they're back. They buy something new. I know Kristen, you touched on this earlier. They, they buy a new product, they're back. Mm -hmm. Like, because we wanna make sure that they're adopting everything really well. Yeah. Mm-hmm, for sure, for sure. 
Well, hey, I think we could talk about this all afternoon long, um, but we are just about out of time. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining today. We had hundreds of people on the line. I want to thank our presenters, Antoinette and Kristen. Uh, we'll be sending along a networking email with the attendees today CC'd. Um, please email us immediately if you do not want to participate in that. Um, but of course, we are hoping to make connections today and keep the conversations going. We hope you enjoyed this opportunity to virtually engage with uh, fellow CS leaders across the industry. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. In our last minute here, Antoinette, what's your dog's name? There are two. Gambit is the loud one and it's his birthday today. He's six. And then Rory is the quiet one that is stealthy and manipulative, but I love them both. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. They participated. So I appreciate they that did. too. They did. They, did. they always do. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you to our presenters and uh, have a good day. Thank you, everybody.